Welcome to Cold Case Detectives Too Close to Home, a monthly Patreon-sponsored series where we select five Patreon supporters at random and examine cases featuring their hometown. If you'd like to see your hometown featured, you can join us on our Patreon linked below. And now let's dive in with five cases from your hometowns. The mysteries that strike too close to home. Reverend Dr. Elliot Spear. Our first case today comes courtesy of our patron, Haley. The Mount Hermon Preparatory School for Boys, located in Northfield, Massachusetts, was founded in 1879 by Dwight Moody, an American evangelist. Prompted by his desire to spread good in the world and help to educate the less fortunate and financially unable, Moody wanted the school, along with its sister school, Northfield Seminary for Young Ladies, to provide learning opportunities for those who were unable to attend school otherwise. However, all that had changed by 1932, when 35-year-old Reverend Dr. Elliot Spear was appointed as the school's headmaster. By this point in time, the establishment's initial purpose had long since been forgotten, and it had become a prep school for the wealthy, rather than for the poor. Elliot was from a long line of religious elites. His father, Robert Elliot Spear, was a well-known and respected Presbyterian leader and writer who often published works on religious subjects. Additionally, Robert was head of the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions. Elliot Spear was born in 1898 and was one of five children born to Robert and his wife Dolly. He was extremely well-educated, attending both Phillips Andover Academy and Princeton University. He also studied at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and attended Columbia in New York. After his studies, he bounced back between the UK and the US. In 1926, he spent some time serving as president of Northfield Schools before he left for the UK again, where he wished to study the British school system. Finally, he returned to Northfield in 1932, where he was appointed as headmaster of Mount Hermon Prep. Elliot's time at the school was tumultuous, as the establishment and Presbyterian Church were essentially suffering from an identity crisis, unable to decide if they wished to move forward with fundamentalist leanings or a more modern approach. Elliot, for his part, was firmly in favor of having a more liberal, modernist view, which meant that his policy changes were not welcomed by everyone. Prior to his takeover, the strict school rules had caused Mount Hermon Prep students to feel as though they were at a monastery rather than an educational establishment. Among other things, Elliot invited a pacifist and socialist named Norman Thomas to speak at the campus. By the summer of 1934, he was continuing to make policy changes, but the controversy and the anger from some had yet to die down. On the evening of September 14th, 1934, Elliot dined with his wife, three children, and father-in-law. Also in the family home was the mother of Elliot's wife. She was recuperating from an accident and currently sharing the home, which sat in a wooded area of the school's 1,200-acre campus. A man of habit, the father of three retired to his study after dinner, where he read and wrote every night alone. Behind his desk sat a large window that looked out into the woods surrounding his home. At around 8.20 p.m., for reasons unknown, Elliot stood from his desk and turned to the window. Suddenly, a 12-gauge shotgun fired point-blank through the window, the blast hitting his right arm and the right side of his chest. His wife and father-in-law rushed to the study as Elliot staggered 20 feet to the doorway where he was found. His last words were, I don't know what happened. The following investigation was difficult for the authorities. They had 1,200 acres of wooded campus to search, and the wide, harsh Connecticut River would have been an easy place for someone to stash a weapon. Furthermore, the area was sparsely populated and rural, meaning witnesses were few and far between. Investigators theorized that either the perpetrator had caught Elliot's attention, which had caused him to stand up, or he had stood up to reach for a book, and the culprit had used that opportunity to pull the trigger. Ballistics experts from Massachusetts State Police recovered shell wadding from beneath a large maple tree 
that stood beside the house. The entire household was questioned shortly after the crime was carried out. A maid working at the home believed that she had heard heavy running footsteps in the garden immediately after the shooting. Another witness claimed to have heard a car speeding away after the blast and identified the vehicle as one that had been parked in front of the school's dining hall, about 200 yards from the home. Shortly after the investigation began, District Attorney Joseph T. Bartlett took over the case. He believed that someone familiar with the school was responsible for the violent crime and noted that no stranger could have possibly found their way in the darkness to the remote location of the family home and later escaped. He described the pathways in the woods as forming a virtual labyrinth. For a brief period of time, authorities felt that this theory was backed up by the fact that neither of the family dogs had made a sound leading up to the crime, suggesting they were not alarmed by the attacker's presence. However, this specific idea was soon ruled out, as neither of the dogs reacted to the presence of investigators in the home, and one of the canines was a puppy who slept locked in a kennel at night at the back of the house. Another fleeting theory was that the slaying had been inspired by a murder mystery novel named The Public School Murder. It told the story of a headmaster who was murdered by a rifle bullet which was shot through his window. Notably, Elliot had a copy of this book in his study. However, there is no evidence to suggest that the perpetrator was inspired by this story. Eventually, the police focused on anyone who wished Elliot dead. They thought that perhaps an unhappy student or teacher was responsible, and even suspected that the culprit was a religious fanatic who didn't agree with the policies Elliot had put in place since being appointed as headmaster of Mount Hermon Prep. Hundreds of leads were followed to their end, and over 4,300 people were interviewed, but to no avail. Investigators even managed to trace a former student who reportedly created a list of violent acts he wished to carry out, including taking the life of Elliot Spear. By the time all of their other leads dried up, authorities were left with only one suspect, Thomas Elder, the school's dean. Both Elliot and Elder were known for their differences. Elder was a staunch fundamentalist who opposed Elliot's changes and was reportedly upset that he had been passed over for the headmaster position. Additionally, he was known for his quick, flaring temper and habit of holding grudges. Upon closer examination, investigators began to believe that Elder could be their man. He had reportedly owned a shotgun of the type used in the crime, although he told detectives that he didn't. Friends of Elder told the authorities that the gun had a defective trigger guard, and following the crime, Elder was noted to have injured his right index finger. Furthermore, he had called Elliot's home on the evening the slaying took place, as if to ascertain whether or not his attack was successful, and two letters alleged to have been exchanged between the two men were located, but thought to have been forged by Elder because he wanted to make it look like the two were friends. There are also some reports that Elder had given Elliot the novel The Public School Report, although it has also been claimed that Elliot already owned the book. The final piece of evidence against Elder was that he had changed several of the clocks on campus, putting the time forward by 15 minutes. Authorities believed that this was to help him obtain an alibi. A young man who had been speaking with Elder on the night of the crime had noticed that the clock in Elder's home was wrong. Despite all this information, Massachusetts Associate Justice Timothy Hayes didn't feel that the prosecution had presented a strong enough case at the inquest into Elliot's murder. The inquest lasted seven days and featured 60 witnesses. Hayes determined that the father of three had been killed by a person unknown to this court. In his later report, he noted that there was a plausible suspect in the case, but that under state law, a circumstantial case must meet several conditions, which the case against Elder did not. Afterwards, Elder retired and moved to New Hampshire, where he began running a poultry farm. He was elected to local office in his township and the rumors of his involvement with Elliot's death were largely dismissed. Six years later, he was arrested for threatening a Mount Hermon school colleague with a shotgun, but was acquitted at trial. Interestingly, on August 30th, 1935, a 12-gauge shotgun was found in a small New Hampshire river. However, this potential lead went nowhere. The case of Elliot Spear remains unsolved. Albert Winkleman. This case comes courtesy of our patron, Jacob Colvin. A dedicated and hard-working policeman 
32-year-old Albert Winkleman had been part of the New Ulm, Minnesota Police Department for less than a year when he was tragically shot dead in cold blood. Working as a night watch officer, Albert left behind a wife and two children following his murder. On July 4th, 1895, at around four o'clock in the morning, Winkleman's cousin, Albert Kiesling, found the father of two in front of his home near the intersection of Front and First South Street. He had been shot in the throat. Kiesling had been alerted that there was somebody outside his house by the sounds of someone groaning. Upon investigation, he found his cousin injured and bloody. Albert Winkleman was promptly taken to the hospital and lived until the following day. After his death, authorities began to look for answers as to who killed one of their own and why. It was initially assumed that the perpetrator was a vagrant. Dr. Weisser, who'd attended the scene, later testified that before Albert passed away, he had been asked if a tramp had shot him. Albert had confirmed that this was the case. Later, a hospital worker testified that while wiping down Albert's face, he had said the words tramp shot to the employee. However, the state of his consciousness was highly debated during this time. Some people declared that he was capable of communication, while others claimed he was drifting in and out of consciousness. Soon, however, the public began to doubt the vagrant theory. Rumors began swirling about a local veterinarian who had had several run-ins with Albert, and locals gossiped about the things he was saying about the deceased officer. Three months after the shooting, Dr. August Coney was arrested in Lamberton for the murder. Several witnesses testified that Coney had borne a grudge against Albert for some time and that he had made threats against the father of two in the days leading up to the murder. Furthermore, it was also declared in court that the pair had a fight three years prior in which Coney had threatened Albert's life, saying he would, quote, put cold lead into Winkleman. Stranger still, the day after the shooting, Coney left town with his family and pawned a revolver. The prosecution began building a case against the veterinarian, which involved multiple witnesses testifying that he had made comments about Albert being dead and out of the way. His boarder in Lamberton, Mr. Nichols, testified that on July 2nd, Coney said that he was returning to New Ulm to, quote, do somebody up. Mr. Nichols added that Coney had sent him to collect a revolver for him before he left town. The pawned revolver was quickly recovered and entered into evidence. Two shells were missing from the weapon, with one determined to have been fired recently. Despite his suspicious statements, however, Coney was ultimately released. Justice Brandt felt that there was a lack of evidence to warrant pursuing a case against him. Additionally, Coney's attorneys argued that Albert had been shot by a tramp. There was very little evidence at the scene where Albert was found. It was established that the father of two had been shot at a close distance, less than two feet, his own service revolver was also still in its holster, suggesting that he had been caught off guard and had not expected to run into trouble. A trail of blood near his body ended near a river in what is now known as Riverside Park. The blood tracks had been left by the murderer. However, this was all the useful information that could be gathered from the scene. Albert's last known movements were traced, but didn't seem to propel the case any further forward. A man named George Book was the last one to see him before the shooting. The pair had been together between 11.30 p.m. and 1 a.m. on the night of July 3rd. They had gone to a train depot to move along a group of vagrants, but reportedly, one managed to get away from the two men. He was last seen near the Franklin Schoolhouse, close to where Albert's body was later discovered. Two years later, in 1897, the sheriff at Steele County sent a letter to law enforcement at Brown County, stating that one of his prisoners had claimed that someone had told them that they had murdered Albert Winkleman. John Ives told the sheriff that a man, who used the names Tom Hagen and Michael Enright, amongst several other aliases, admitted to firing the gun which had resulted in Albert's death. According to Ives, Enright said that he came to New Ulm by boxcar on July 3rd and had trouble with an officer who ordered him and others out of town. The officer returned to the boxcar later that evening, where a group of vagrants pinned him against the train. Enright admitted that he then shot the officer in the neck. However, the officer managed to free himself and gave chase. Enright escaped and later learned that the officer had died. Interestingly, the depot was not far from where Albert was discovered. 
Despite this alleged confession, no other charges were ever brought against anyone else in the case. Albert's murder is still unsolved. He was laid to rest in the pioneer section of the New Ulm City Cemetery. David Blockett. Our third case today comes from our patron, Carrie Reitman. On the afternoon of December 11th, 1980, a 19-year-old mother of two, Vanessa Blockett, was surprised to hear a knock at her door as she wasn't expecting any company other than her mother, who was already in the apartment on the 13th Street in Newport News, Virginia. Upon opening the door, Vanessa was met with a young African-American woman who introduced herself as Marie Kelly and who claimed she was a social worker. She explained that the State Department of Social Services was sponsoring a function for children at the Riverside Regional Medical Center and that she was gathering up the local children to take to the party. She showed Vanessa the list she had, with the names of all the neighborhood children on it. Vanessa noted that while the name of her two-week-old son, David Blockett, was on the list, her two-year-old wasn't. When the mother of two voiced this thought aloud, Marie Kelly replied that she would be happy to take both children to the party, so Vanessa agreed to let her children go. Nothing seemed amiss until a few hours later, when Vanessa received a phone call from the police. Two-year-old Frederick had been found wandering alone at a shopping center near Old Mallory Road in Hampton, Virginia, about 10 miles from home. He had a piece of paper in his pocket with his name and address on it, which allowed him to be returned home safely to his family. However, there was no sign of his younger brother, David. Vanessa immediately reported the two-week-old baby missing. Detectives couldn't help but feel hopeful about his return, since his sibling had been left with his name and address, authorities felt that someone with compassion had taken the children. They also felt that if the children had been abducted to be sold into human trafficking, then Frederick would not have been left behind. Hopes were raised further when, later, on the same day of the disappearance, a woman called Vanessa and asked her what kind of formula the baby was taking. The woman hung up before the call could be traced, but the police felt more confident that either the abductor was caring for David or she planned to sell him to a wealthy family that was unable to have their own children. Either way, authorities felt positive that he was being cared for. Of course, this didn't ease the mind of his mother, Vanessa, who was still frantic about her missing baby. Law enforcement was able to confirm that the State Department of Social Services had no record of a Marie Kelly working for them, nor were they able to find an employee matching her description. Furthermore, there was no party being held by the department. Over a week after the vanishing, on December 23rd, authorities came across a nappy changing bag and a leather folder near Colonial Parkway in Yorktown, Virginia. It is believed that these items belonged to the person responsible for taking David. The items were clean and in good condition, suggesting once more to investigators that no harm had come to the baby. Inside, they found booties, a blanket, a sweatshirt, and a pair of jeans. The bag also contained a comb with hair still attached to it. These items are still in police possession, and they intend on DNA testing the items, although it is unclear if they have done so yet. Both local and state police participated in the search for David, and they were assisted by the FBI. While canvassing the area in an attempt to find witnesses, they discovered that a woman matching Marie Kelly's description had come to the door of another family and attempted to gain access to their newborn baby. However, the mother had told her to leave. Authorities believed that Marie Kelly had got the names of the children from a local newspaper a few days earlier, which contained a listing of the recently born children and their addresses. In a bizarre twist of events, two of David's nephews were taken in June of 2011. The children, aged five and six, were the sons of David's younger brother, Dante. Their mother, Yovanda, took them to work with her when a woman approached her and asked for a lift to North Carolina. Yovanda agreed and told the woman, whose name was Summer Panel, to take her car and take the children to the park until she finished work. Instead, however, the trio vanished. Luckily, all three of them were found unharmed in Halifax, North Carolina, several hours later. Summer Panel was charged with abduction. She reportedly had a long history of mental health issues and, in January of 2012, was found not guilty by reason of insanity. In the years since David's disappearance, there has been no trace of him. It has been theorized that he is still alive, 
but doesn't even know he is a missing person. His mother, Vanessa, died of a brain aneurysm when she was just 35. His older brother, Frederick, now lives in North Carolina. As an adult, he can remember vague snippets about the day David went missing. He recalls playing with a cassette tape he found in the car, that a man had driven the two brothers with Marie Kelly in the passenger seat, and that neither adult would look at the children. He hopes one day to be reunited with David. Marie Kelly is described as an African-American woman between the ages of 32 and 35, with big hips and a medium complexion. She is around 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 8, and weighs between 145 to 155 pounds. David Blockett went missing from his home on 13th Street in Newport News, Virginia, on December 11th, 1980. He is an African-American male with black hair and brown eyes. He was only 15 days old when he went missing, weighing seven pounds and standing at one foot eight. He has a tiny mole on his right ear and birthmarks under his arm, on his back, and on his buttocks. If he is still alive, he will be 41 years old. If you have any information about David's disappearance, you can contact the Newport News Police Department on 757-928-4100. Thomas Gregory Demian. Our penultimate case in this month's episode of Too Close to Home comes from our patron Carly, who chose the city of Sparks in Maryland. Unfortunately, we were unable to find a suitable case from this location, so we broadened our search and found a bizarre missing persons case from Cockeysville, which is just a six minute drive from Sparks. On the evening of January 13th, 1997, at around 6.15 p.m., Thomas Tommy Gregory Demian left his home in Gertine Court. The 47-year-old was in a rush after his lawyer, John Austin, sent him a page followed by 911, which was the code the pair used to indicate that Austin needed Tommy to call him immediately. As Tommy didn't have a phone in his residence, which had previously belonged to his father, he was used to making the trip to a nearby Days Inn so he could use the payphone there. After throwing on a jacket, Tommy quickly left the house. He left behind his wallet, ID, and his partial denture, and told his wife, Cynthia, that he'd be right back. However, the 47-year-old was never seen or heard from again. He left behind a seven-year-old son, Gregory, along with his wife, who reported him missing the following day. When authorities began investigating, they swiftly determined that Tommy had made it to the payphone as he had left a message on his lawyer's voicemail. Austin, for his part, was confused by the message, claiming that he'd never paged his clients the night before. As investigators explored further, they found out that Tommy's life had recently gotten complicated after his father, Thomas R. Demian, had passed away from heart failure aged 81 in December of 1996. His father had founded a company named Tom Car Corp, which was based in Timonium, Maryland, and which was described by the Baltimore Sun as making a, quote, patented device called Safety Sight to monitor radiator fluid in truck engines. In the 1990s, the device brought in more than $400,000 a year, the modern day equivalent of around $689,000. But the company was troubled and in financial shambles. Another Baltimore Sun article states that the balance sheets didn't balance and that both the company's accounting systems and tax returns were indecipherable. Following Tommy's disappearance, it came to light that his father had been financially supporting him. A chronic gambler, Tommy frequented Las Vegas, Nevada, and Atlantic City, and often bet on horse races. He was reportedly in debt to several gambling associates. His father was also known to be a gambler who used the business to fund his own habits. Following Thomas's demise, Tommy was set to inherit Tom Carr Corp. After Thomas had a stroke in April of 1996, his business partners had gotten a restraining order against Tommy, barring him from access to the company as they accused him of embezzlement. They alleged that he'd siphoned off $58,000 into an account that was unknown to them. Tommy's lawyer, John Austin, argued that the 47-year-old had taken the money because he feared someone else in the company was trying to drain the money away. After Tommy went missing, his wife, Cynthia, accused her father-in-law's business partners of being involved with his disappearance. Notably, the restraining order they had filed against him expired the day he went missing. 
Initially, investigators believed that the vanishing was linked to Tommy's gambling debts, but Cynthia claimed they were not so bad that he would be murdered over them. By 1999, detectives had dismissed this theory, though they continued to believe that the father of one had met with foul play. However, the authorities have not disclosed their own hypotheses. Online sleuths have theorized that someone from his father's company wished him harm. Others speculate that his gambling debts were much worse than his wife knew. However, it has been argued that if Tommy was about to come into both an inheritance and a company, why kill him off? Six months after he went missing, the floorboards of a bar in Fells Point were pulled up by investigators who were acting on a tip. However, they found no trace of Tommy. After the disappearance, Thomas's business partners bought out the remaining business. Cynthia and Gregory were forced to move in with relatives in West Virginia as Thomas's house was sold to pay his debts. Tommy's credit cards and social security number have not been used since he went missing. He was declared legally dead in 1999. 47-year-old Thomas Demian was last seen leaving his home in Gertine Court on January 13th, 1997 at around 6.15 p.m. He went to make a phone call at a nearby Days Inn and never returned home. Tommy is a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was balding at the time of his disappearance. He is five foot 10, has dentures in place of his front teeth, and uses the nickname Tommy. When he was last seen, he weighed 230 pounds and wore a green resort jacket, tan trousers, and no shirt. If he is still alive, he will be 72 years old. If you have any information about Tommy's disappearance, you can call the Baltimore County Police Department on 410-307-2020. Serenity Denard. Our final case this month comes from our patron, Miranda Mack. Born on May 12th, 2009, Serenity Denard is described by her loved ones as intelligent and bubbly with a big personality. Taken from her biological parents as an infant, Serenity spent much of her childhood in the foster care system, where she stayed in about 12 different foster homes. In October of 2014, after being fostered by them for several months, Chad Dennard and his wife Darcy adopted Serenity, and Chad and his new partner Cassandra gained primary custody of the little girl. Darcy Gentry retained secondary custody. Cassandra, Chad, Serenity, and her three siblings lived in Sturgis, South Dakota. During her early childhood, Serenity suffered trauma and, as a result, frequently ran away, threatened to harm herself, broke toys, and struggled to make connections with other children. She was diagnosed as having severe reactive attachment disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation, a disorder that manifested in extreme mood swings. The young girl's habit of running away didn't improve even after several years of outpatient therapy. Eventually, in July of 2018, Chad and Cassandra sent Serenity to live temporarily at the Black Hills Children's Home in the 24,100 block of Rockerville Road outside Rapid City. The home acted as a treatment center for children with emotional and behavioral issues. Serenity's parents felt it was no longer safe for her to remain at home, and the center would provide her with therapy and schooling. It was expected that Serenity would be discharged in September of 2019. Her parents saw her between four and five times a month, and she called them twice a week. They believed she was making good progress. On February 2nd, 2019, Chad visited his nine-year-old daughter. Nothing seemed amiss, and Serenity appeared to be in good spirits. He and her other family members were aware that she had a history in the home of hiding from the staff and would threaten to run away on occasion. She once ran away from the establishment while playing outside, but the staff managed to catch her. Despite all this, Serenity was on track to be released in September and was, by all accounts, making improvements. Then, the following day, on February 3rd at around 10.45 a.m., Serenity played in the gym with a few of the other children. Reportedly, the nine-year-old hatched a plan with one of the other residents of the home, who acted as a distraction for Serenity so she could make her escape. As two staff members watched over the children, the resident who'd plotted with Serenity ran out of the gym, although they stayed inside the building. One of the staff members went after the child, while the other stayed behind, and Serenity made a break for it, exiting out of the building and into the car park. 
as it was against the rules to leave children unsupervised. The remaining staff member stayed where they were and called for help as Serenity fled. Two witnesses, a grandmother and granddaughter, spotted the nine-year-old as they entered the campus at around 11 a.m. She was walking northbound on South Rockerville Road, near the cattle guard in front of the home, and was not wearing a jacket, despite the sub-zero temperatures. While the grandmother went inside to alert staff, the granddaughter stayed in the car and kept her eyes on Serenity. However, she lost sight of the nine-year-old when she entered a wooded area. When the grandmother returned, the pair attempted to find Serenity, but failed to do so. She has never been seen or heard from again. According to BHCH policy, if a child went missing, staff were to notify the police within a reasonable time. However, after Serenity went missing, staff searched around the surrounding area for an hour and 41 minutes before alerting the authorities. Police officers and volunteers came together to help in the subsequent search for the missing nine-year-old, which is the largest in South Dakota's history. On the first day, investigators searched until 10 p.m., but after a few days, the search was reclassified from a rescue to a recovery effort, given the extremely cold temperature. Authorities did not believe that Serenity would be able to survive more than a couple of days out in the wilderness due to the extreme cold. Since she went missing, 66 agencies have helped in the search, using dog teams, aircrafts, and thermal devices. Investigators have carried out 465 interviews and followed 224 leads across 36 states and four countries. In the first six months alone, 1,200 people assisted in the search, and in the first year, 4,500 miles of rough terrain were covered. The hunt for the missing nine-year-old was called off one week shy of the second anniversary of her disappearance. The case is now suspended until new information comes to light. The BHCH, for its part, has received mountains of criticism for the way it handled Serenity's escape and subsequent disappearance. She had previously been under a strict arm's length only style of monitoring, but this changed in the days before she ran away much to her parents' distress. BHCH was investigated by the State Department of Social Services after the incident, with the inquiry concluding that the home hadn't provided suitable levels of supervision for someone with Serenity's tendencies. It also noted that the home lacked an appropriate emergency preparedness plan, that the initial search was disorganized, and that the 101-minute delay between Serenity vanishing and the police being notified was not a reasonable time. As a result, the state gave BHCH a corrective action plan that involved staff immediately notifying the authorities when a child went missing. The two staff members who'd been overseeing the children were fired from their positions, but the director of the home remained employed, as did the supervisor who had advised the staff members to search longer before calling the emergency services. Both of Serenity's biological parents are in prison and are not suspects in the case. Her adoptive mother, Darcy, has since remarried and now lives in Rapid Valley. Both Darcy and Chat have been at the receiving end of online theories that suggest that one or both of the parents were involved, despite the fact that they both have alibis and are not persons of interest. There is no evidence to suggest that Darcy, Chad, or Cassandra were involved. On August 28th, 2021, the family announced that they had hired an Indiana-based investigation firm to look into Serenity's disappearance. The firm is made up of FBI and police veterans, and while they have outlined their strategy to news outlets, they have noted that, quote, the odds are not with us on this one. The Pennington County Sheriff's Office still believes that Serenity succumbed to the elements, although they are baffled that her remains have not turned up despite the extensive searches that have been carried out in the last two years. Chad has stated his belief that his daughter is still out there, stating that she liked to run away, but never went far. He also added, quote, she liked to see people looking for her. I think she watched people look for her, and I think she went too far and got lost. That is just serenity, and she had done that before. Meanwhile, Darcy has left the nine-year-old's bedroom untouched, hoping she will one day set foot in it again. Serenity Denard was just nine years old when she went missing from Black Hills Children's Home in the 24,100 block of Rockerville Road outside Rapid City in South Dakota at around 10.45 a.m. on February 3rd, 2019. 
She is a white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. When she was last seen, Serenity was 4 foot 7 to 4 foot 9, weighed around 96 pounds, and wore a long sleeved grey floral shirt, purple tank top, blue stonewashed jeans, and black snow boots. If she is still alive, she will be 12 years old. If you have any information about Serenity's disappearance, you can contact the Pennington County Sheriff's Office on 605 394 6115. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for as little as $2 each month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.